Hello everyone, good morning or good afternoon or good evening for wherever you are from around the world. Hello, my name is Saul Matthews and I'm the Vice President of Sales with Synaptic and welcome uh, to another one in our series of webinars talking about the applications and benefits of distributed electrical sensing or DES as we'll call it today. Uh, for everyone's information, uh, our website is always available with a lot of backup information on, on our technologies and white papers and case studies. So that's our name, Synaptec, spelt S-Y-N-A-P-T dot E-C. You put the dot between the T and the E of our word. And of course, we'll be recording this webinar and making it available later on uh, to the people who have registered and joined us first. And then later on, it'll be posted onto our YouTube channel for people to review later on. But again, thank you all for joining. And I hope you'll find this an educational experience because as our company grows, we kind of assume that everyone understands what DES is and how it works. Uh, but there are so many new regions and customers and applications that we're developing for this technology. We thought it was a good idea to reset and help everyone understand what this technology is and, and how it works. So today's webinar is to address those ideas. And I'm going to take you through some slides now. One point of housekeeping, you'll notice that uh, there is a Q&A channel available to you for questions and answers, and our application engineers are monitoring that channel. So while I'm talking, if you don't understand a particular concept or you've got questions at a more deep or technical level, please ask them. We'll keep an eye on all of them. We'll do our best to answer them in real time, but if we can't, we'll catch up at the end of this session in the QA and review what were the most frequently asked or common questions and try to help everyone understand the answers. Uh, you will notice also that the chat channel is disabled uh, for these webinars, so it'll just be me talking you through some slides, but please use the Q&A, the team are there to help you. So uh, we'll go through quickly who we are and how this works. Uh, and so with no further ado, some of you may know this, but some of you may not, that, that this is actually our 10th year and our anniversary at Synaptech. Um, so uh, back in 2014, uh, a very small team of people invented this technology that we call distributed electrical sensing. In effect, this is talking about uh, distributed sensors that can reach out beyond the substation fence and accurately and consistently give you insights and data about remote HV and medium voltage assets that are very far away outside the fence of the substation because we can reach out a long way and we can monitor assets without any control power or telecommunications or even data. These are passive sensors that can be deployed far away to give you information about what's happening in the power system, uh, substantially re reducing both the capital cost of instrumenting a complex power network, but also reducing the carbon footprint and operational costs as a result of the data insights that we've got. Um, it sounds like a relatively new technology, but it's already used in a lot of transmission systems around the world and also now uh, in offshore wind. Uh, and we'll cover a few examples of this. But very generally, it's probably worth saying why we're here and why Synaptic even has a business uh, with distributed sensing. And it comes down to something very simple. As the world demands more and more electric power, uh, the uh, world wants to both decarbonize and decentralize the generation of green energy. And that typically uh, causes a lot of challenges for the traditional infrastructure and the power network. So while we want to embrace renewables and repurpose this infrastructure, we've got to do it in a way which is uh, making sure that safety is still high, availability is still high, resiliency is even improved, and risk is reduced, and certainly uh, maintaining or not increasing the cost of energy for the consumer. But basically, decentralization and decarbonization and an attempt to digitalize the network requires a lot more distributed measurements in many remote and inaccessible places because of the nature of, for example, offshore wind and new grid connections. And that means we want more visibility and control in these places and we want it more affordably. Now, that is a challenge for the industry because typically if you want to measure something as fundamental and simple as a current or a voltage at a remote site, you need buildings, civil works, planning permission or zoning, as it would be called in America. You would need uh, control power, copper wiring, active electronics, buildings to house all this in and dedicated telecommunications infrastructure to obtain signals and bring them back to the centre uh, in a rapid and meaningful and accurate way. Now, even the telecommunications can cost uh, 
hundreds of thousands of euros or dollars. So it's also a challenge to deploy many of them and synchronize all those uh, data points and even access places that are remote or inaccessible where there's no power or telecommunications readily available. And this is where Synaptic helps. We remove the need for buildings, control power, those copper wiring uh, and associated infrastructure. We remove the need for uh, the telecommunications infrastructure because our sensors operate outside of the firewall of the substation, literally without data. Now, um, to explain this in more detail and to give everyone an overview, and again, apologies if some of you know this and you're familiar with us, but there are so many new customers and business partners of ours, we have to really cover this. But distributed electronic electrical sensing is simply a platform technology that has multiple uses and this chart tries to sort of capture everything so some of you will be more interested in some areas than others but what you can see here is that from within the firewall of the substation at the center here with a centralized measurement and publishing system we can reach out using light going through optical fibers to very remote locations uh, which is very powerful for monitoring subsea or underground cable systems uh, instrumenting uh, complex circuits that have maybe mixed overhead and underground lines. We'll show you some of those or multiple tee off points and branches uh, with multiple terminations uh, or simply monitoring an asset which is just hard to access because it's in the middle of a remote area and simply far away and expensive or dangerous to reach safely to do manual inspections. So Half of our business is actually about the enhancement of protection and control functions for complex circuits. The other half uh, of our business and the deployment of this technology is very much about online and permanent condition monitoring of remote but valuable assets that are critical to either generation or the continuity of supply of energy to uh, countries. So distributed electrical sensing fundamentally is a precision instrumentation technology uh, where we have this idea of passive sensors that can be deployed somewhere far from the substation. It's very quick, safe, and easy to install them. They are synchronous uh, and we can monitor many different locations at the same time and we can't, we don't lose sync. It conforms to all of the IEC standards that you would expect for uh, the synchronization of measurements. It can go very long distances by using the standard single mode optical fiber that's available in most high voltage power networks, because of course, uh, optical fiber is the gold standard for low loss, high bandwidth, long range telecommunications. So we're leveraging a telecoms infrastructure that's already available to reach out and take very accurate measurements. And these measurements by definition are data secure because there is no data outside the substation. So you can't spoof or hack these signals. And also they're very stable. So the way our technology works means that it's very much immune to things like environmental changes of temperature or humidity and rain or weather conditions, or even electromagnetic interference. So many people have had experience over the years with uh, technologies like low power instrument transformers or non-conventional instrument transformers that are using the Faraday effect to polarize light and measure current in a conductor uh, by polarizing the light in a fiber that's round around the conductor. That's not the same physics and it's not what we're doing. We've taken another step forward and discovered a technology which is immune to the problems that LCITs or NCITs classically have. Now, to take an overview of it, and this might look confusing, but we'll go through it for you. The core of the technology, it's in components. So it's a very modular and scalable system. The core of the technology is this second column here. We have an interrogator, uh, effectively a 5P class um, uh, IED uh, that's designed for protection and control purposes, normally based in the substation where there's power and telecommunications available. And this interrogator connects to a fiber which can reach outside of the substation fence and along that fiber you can put in series or serially multiplex a whole array of different kinds of sensors in different locations and all the pictures you're seeing to the right are different kinds of sensors uh, the ones in the teal green color uh, labeled psc those are the electrical sensors measuring any current or any voltage and then over to the right you've got the orange uh, sensors these are mechanical sensors that can measure uh, measurements such as temperature or vibration or strain and 
it doesn't actually matter which sensor you put out there. Uh, any combination of them can work, and the signals all come back to the central point where they are processed, timestamped, and published using industry standard formats. Now, although these components don't look familiar to many, they are using familiar standards and familiar techniques. We use industry standard current transformers and voltage transformers to take measurements, and we're doing industry standard uh, protection algorithms and industry standard outputs from our interrogator. We have dry contacts and streaming digital uh, data using IEC 61850 sampled values. So the beginning and the end of the process isn't new. It's using standard technology. The clever part is how we package the sensors and connect them through the fiber and using it as a long range net network for our sensors, which is what the fiber was for. So all the pictures you're seeing of the products below here, they're just different ways to package the product and the sensors according to environmental conditions and IP ratings, and if it's got to be in a desert or under the sea or somewhere far away uh, up a mountain, that's what these things do. But we can reach out and see a lot of information and deliver it, and it only becomes data centrally in the substation. And you'll see on the left here, by the way, I should also mention about synthesis. Uh, when we do protection and control applications, of course, we're trying to uh, inform a protection relay to trip or to inform a relay how to reclose selectively or in a more granular way as a post-event response. But when we're not doing protection and control, we're gathering data and this data has inherent value. So we stream that data and we can store it, stage it and present it as usable condition monitoring data to optimize scheduled maintenance or to uh, provide early warning of failures and faults. Some people ask us simply to stream that data or use a REST API to access the data so it can integrate with SCADA or with uh, asset performance management systems. But Synthesis is the sort of data analytics platform that we use that can take hundreds, a scalable number, any number of interrogator data and bring it to life by either visualizing it or formatting and staging the data for someone else to consume. So that's like an overview of the modular and scalable nature of the technology and what the components look like. But uh, many people also ask us, well, how does this actually work in real life? So if you kind of get under the skin of this technology and you want to understand the fundamental uh, functionality, uh, the sensors actually use a very standard, again, standards-based technology. Uh, we use fiber brag ratings, which are prevalent in the telecommunications industry. It's used all the time in uh, optical uh, ethernet broadband services through fiber. And effectively, a fiber brag rating, uh, engineers hate me for saying this, but it is just a mirror. It's a mirror inserted into the fiber so that when our interrogator illuminates the fiber over a long distance, each sensor, wherever you need it to be placed, is configured to allow all the light to go through, but to reflect one very tightly specified color or wavelength of light. So if you will, the first FBG one that you can see here might reflect red and the second one might reflect blue and the third one might reflect green. And they're all reflecting light back simultaneously back to the center so that the light is going forwards and backwards through the same fiber. And we can put in series or daisy chain up to 30 sensors along 60 kilometers range of that optical fiber and bring measurements back to the center. And it's only then that the interrogator, as I said, tidies up that signal, timestamps it and publishes it and it becomes meaningful data. But outside it's light going forwards and backwards through the fiber. And that means because it's wavelength multiplex and wavelength division, and we're not doing time domain uh, multiplexing or any other format, you really do see everything everywhere all at once. And there is no variable latency or, or timing issues between the sensors. It all complies to the standards. Now that's very important because um, it means we can see a lot of locations that are far away. Now on that optical fiber where we've introduced this small mirror, we can then place uh, a piezoelectric stack and, and for those of you who know this stuff, piezoelectrics respond directly, very accurately and proportionately when you apply a voltage field to them. So we can apply any voltage and that will cause the piezo to uh, react and that will effectively pull or push the mirror. And that changes the color of light reflected back. And these 
microscopic, and I mean picometer, changes in the color of uh, light reflected back by these gratings tells you about that voltage. If we then add a precision burden resistor, we can go from any current to a voltage to strain in the fiber and a color of light back to the center, which means in this packaging that you saw before, we can put together these elements in a small hermetically sealed package that would fit in the palm of my hand, four by two centimeters. And this would give you a very precise and consistent measurement uh, over decades. In fact, we've tested them past 140 years without any accuracy loss. Uh, these will perform over decades without never needing to be recalibrated, maintained, repowered or having any batteries swapped out or relying on any kind of 4G or IoT network. We're simply using light to communicate back and forth with a very simple passive device that can directly measure voltage and therefore also current. Now, if you took that piezo element away and you just look at the FBG itself, it is fundamentally an optical strain gauge. And you can apply this uh, by mounting both ends of that mirror onto a surface and if that surface heats up, again, it will pull or push the mirror, or if it vibrates, it will be detected. Uh, and therefore, you can also derive strain, low frequency vibration signals from these sensors. And that becomes very powerful when you combine both of them. And I'll show you some examples of how they're already being used. But it means you've got a very simple platform that can monitor permanently and synchronously all these measure rounds over a wide area. And it's the relationship between those measure rounds and the difference in signals from comparable assets that gives you a lot of clues about asset performance management, online condition monitoring, or impending failures and faults. Um, now, talking about failures and faults, uh, I did say that this is a uh, 5P class uh, protection system. And just to kind of validate that statement for everyone, yes, of course, it's tested by Kima Labs and it's certified to do so. And we thought it would be interesting to show you these uh, graphical plots here, uh, which comes out of a, a, a lab test or like an, an FAT test where they were comparing fault response from our system to a standard electromechanical relay. And you can see it's directly comparable and gives a very high level of accuracy, meets all of the standards, as I say, for 618.850 and 618.69 relating to timings, latency, data outputs. And because there is no intermediation or variable latency between the source of our signal and the processing of it centrally. It all comes at the speed of light to the center. It, we don't need digital networks to packet those data and send packets and check the send and come through from different places. It therefore is the fastest multi-zone protection system in the world. Uh, we'll be able to see a fault 50, 60 kilometers away, and uh, we'll be able to issue a trip signal and see those problems in yeah, like under two milliseconds is, is entirely possible. So it's incredibly reliable, very simple, and very fast. When you put that together, uh, you can start seeing some application opportunities. Now, I can't tell you today in this call or this format every possible way that this technology is used because there are literally too many different applications. But we tried to pick three or four that would be interesting and relevant for a general audience. And of course, the goal today is to make you aware of them. And maybe you'll come back to us afterwards and say, oh, well, that was interesting. Or actually, no, that's not what I need. This is my problem. Well, we're a team of engineers. And if you present your operational challenges and problems to us, we'll engineer a solution to fit it. And a lot of our business has come out of that ability to be responsive and rapidly adapt our technology for different circumstances. Uh, and I'll try and give you a flavor of that with some of these examples. So please don't think this is an exhaustive or definitive list of what we do. But uh, to give you some sense of one of the most typical applications we find and how our sensors deploy onto the network, uh, I chose this one. Uh, for us. So the concept here is you've got a, a circuit leaving the substation. Normally you've got overhead power lines, but suddenly somewhere far away, maybe 20, 30, 40 kilometers away, there's a dip and there's a cable section that's been introduced. This is very typical in many countries, either because 
Uh, you must underground the lines as they come out of the substation with a cable tail end section, or you could have a cable section remotely because of a requirement to clean up the view, you know, for, for tourism and aesthetics, or it's because we're clearing obstacles uh, where there's new urban development or uh, there's an immovable, you know, object in the way like a mountain or a lake. Um, it can it can be a requirement to suddenly introduce a cable section uh, into the circuit. And this presents a challenge from a protection and control perspective, because, of course, um, what we would like to do in the event of a fault is to auto reclose on that fault. Uh, the assumption being that the fault is on an overhead line and maybe it's a lightning strike and the power will dissipate after a couple of seconds and you can reclose and continue supply safely. But if the fault's underground, you know, a permanent fault has occurred and you don't want to reclose on that fault. So now it becomes difficult. The idea here is that you can put our sensors at the each end of the cable section, three current sensors at the near end, three current sensors at the far end. And now we've created a separate or independent protected section. And if there is a fault, we will be able to tell in sub-cycle timeframes in milliseconds whether the fault is in that cable section or by default, it's not and it's overhead. And that means our system is telling the protection scheme if it's overhead, you can go ahead and auto reclose. If it's definitely underground, we will block the auto reclose command using industry standard algorithms like 87L to differentiate. Now, this example is one cable section where you'd have those three current sensors. And you can see the little circle there on the right. That study is showing you uh, an industry standard CT because the customer specifies, I want 5P10 or 5P20, 5P30, whatever the dynamic ranges or the multiple above nominal you want to measure as a fault, that can be installed and that's a standard iron core CT, the same as you use for all other protection purposes. But our sensor is packaged in an IP67 rated box. That's the silver box you can see there. And we're simply attaching to the CT using the copper secondaries coming out of that CT and taking that measurement and bringing it back. So as the line goes along, the fiber runs typically through the OPGW and it can reach these points. And of course, you'll know that when these cable sections come up and terminate normally about eight to 10 meters in the air on the platform, you'll have the hang off for the three phases and the fiber also terminates at that point. So it's super easy to access the fiber there, connect the three uh, and daisy chain, if you like, the three sensors together, then take the fiber back into the patch box and then it can continue to the next place. But this becomes a very simple way. And I think I've implied this, but I should say it expressly. This means you can retrofit these sensors pretty much anywhere to give you this more granular and targeted post-event response to a fault. Uh, and the more complex circuits become because they've either got multiple tap points or, or you know many branches or they've got significant amounts of cable, then this technology becomes even more useful. So to extend that idea of what we would call mixed circuit protection, uh, you could extend that thought and say, well, uh, there's not one cable section, but maybe there are several cable sections in series. And in fact, one of the big deployments we've got right now in Europe I think is going over, uh, the line is going over mountain to lake to mountain to lake about seven times. So there are multiple cable sections in series along that route. And what we are able to do is instrument all of them individually and give very precise and granular information about how to respond to that fault, no matter how far away the cable section is or how many of them there are. And again, it's scalable. Uh, one of these interrogators is perfectly capable of monitoring uh, three or four uh, cable sections simultaneously along the feeder. Now here, the example is of course that I'm doing it in series, but it could also be done in parallel where you've got multiple uh, circuits and feeders leaving a substation and you've got the ability to monitor in parallel, uh, incurring even more space and cost savings at a kind of panel instrument or bay instrumentation level. So in this example, this could be uh, several uh, circuits leaving the, the substation, or it could be representative of a microgrid, for example, uh, where you've got multiple sections operating in parallel. And again, we're bringing all that information, which is encoded in light, back to a central point to the interrogator. And then we're normally 
giving a dry contact to the protection relay to tell it to trip and to reclose, or it's also digital ready. So we're also able to stream 61850-9-2 sampled values or goose uh, if you're ready. So, so this is a future proof technology as well that's ready today, but also digital ready tomorrow as people move to a digital substation concept using process bus or station bus. Uh, but the point here is that it's centralized, but it's scalable, either in series or parallel over many elements of a circuit over a long distance. Now that's a typical example of what we do with protection and control. Um, this could be extended through distribution and even into private networks and industrial networks as well. Uh, you could well have, and we've seen examples of very complex feeders that have got uh, a lot of complexity with multiple uh, branches and tap-off points, as you can see here. And we've noticed, of course, many operators are using a distance protection scheme uh, which is fine, but you with distance protection, of course, you can't know exactly which branch or which zone contained the fault. And what we're able to do is break up that long linear asset into multiple zones and be much more discreet about, well, exactly which fault uh, is in what zone. And this is incredibly useful because it's, again, operating and responding in sub-cycle fault detection times and speeding up clearance of faults. It's uh, differential protection enabled over distance protection. So it's very dependable and very reliable. It's very accurate. Uh, and it's really the right way uh, to, to manage this complexity and give you more granular control over the circuit. But of course, uh, this is like a typical kind of made up example of one. Um, and if you have in your mind the idea that we can reach out from the substation and break up these linear assets into small sections. They can be incredibly detailed and accurate within that zone to be sensitive enough to look for things like uh, faults coming from tree contact or mid-span phase faults, or uh, maybe it's something as simple as uh, a high impedance fault. Uh, and you're trying to find out if the line has come down so that we can kill the power before the line touches the ground, which obviously has an enormous implication for wildfire ignition or for simply for safety, uh, because it is that fast and that discreet. It really is the right way to provide a backup scheme for a circuit. And often we're now used for simply upgrading from distance protection to differential or unit protection for a feeder because it's simpler and cheaper to do it like this because you don't need to build in the complex interconnected telecommunications infrastructure that would be required to bring all the differential currents back to the source to be compared to calculate where the fault is. So this is a real enabler to get past the complexity of circuits that are becoming more and more complex due to the growth of new grid connections and renewables around the world. Now, all of that therefore could be titled as DES is very powerful and an ideal solution for uh, breaking up a circuit into more manageable pieces and protecting it with more granularity and accuracy. But while that is absolutely true, it also provides a lot of value to asset operators before there's a fault. Uh, because uh, particularly with power cables that are either underground or underwater or subsea, in fact, um, you've got an asset which is critical, but incredibly remote and inaccessible. You can't easily go down there and inspect it because it's in a trench or in a tunnel or it's under the sea. And so in those scenarios, this technology is also applied. Now, the reason is that uh, when you look at uh, how cables have been traditionally monitored, uh, we've been using as an industry technologies like distributed temperature sensing, DTS, or DAS, which is acoustic sensing. Maybe in subsea, there's ROV inspections, you know, with remote operated submarines taking photographs of displacement and moving or deburial from a trench. Uh, PD monitoring has been experimented with as an online monitoring tool to look for problems. And of course, you can manually inspect these assets in tunnel systems if you've got human access. But these vital assets are incredibly difficult to monitor and manual inspection, even partial discharge monitoring and the traditional DTS and DAS monitoring are only looking at the structural integrity of the insulation itself 
is the cable still secure or is there a crack in the insulation that's going to cause a failure? Now, that has some benefit and there's nothing wrong with spending money on DAS or DTS or manual inspection. But these locations, the cable itself, it turns out, is not where most of the cable failures occur. Uh, in fact, these technologies are unable to see joints, terminations and link boxes, cross bonding points. And these are where most failures occur. So unfortunately, what happens is the traditional monitoring technologies will give you a later confirmation that the insulation has already started to fail. What we really want is earlier warnings so that we've got time to do something about it before there's a catastrophic failure or a thermal runaway in a cable. And that means instrumenting the joints and terminations in a lot more detail that these technologies can't do. So in fact, we don't say this, uh, DNV data that's often been shared and quoted at conferences like GCARB and Seagray will talk about the fact that about 31% of all cable failures that have been recorded uh, are failures of the insulation itself, but the, the remainder, 69% of all cable failures recorded so far were, came from these joints and terminations. And this is a complicated mix of electrical stresses and mechanical stresses and environmental factors that cause these problems. But the point is, our sensor technology, DES, can directly monitor these locations and look for these uh, electrical stresses. So if you consider this as a timeline where we're going from normal operation towards a failure, and then what that costs as you go later and later towards a failure to do anything about or to repair and fix, we discover that inspections and ROV monitoring is simply not frequent enough to catch problems early on it's not likely you'll see them and visual inspection is difficult to see what you want to know is the content of those cables so it's missing the joints and terminations uh, which is also something that dts and das can't see and all we're saying is that dts technology is very well positioned to give you that permanent monitoring and looking for the correlation uh, between electrical and mechanical uh, failure modes so in fact a classic example would be, uh, imagine a power cable where you've got uh, a very low current at a given time, but one termination is running particularly hot. Now, if we can correlate that that's hot with a low load, that's a warning. That means that cable is about to um, uh, run away and, and explode. Uh, and it's probably too late to do something about it. But if you can see all of those joints and terminations and compare the load current and the temperature of the termination at every point all the time, then you can start for looking for what's normal and what's a good healthy relationship and then what's abnormal and how fast it's deviating. So at a simple level, we add to what DTS does by adding the joints and terminations, that's two thirds of the places that you have a failure. And then we're looking for correlations between, or the relationship between load current and temperature or load current temperature and sheath current, because then we can see screen discontinuities, wet faults, serial faults, flashing faults, omic overheating, corrosion, uh, evidence of poor installation, which often is the real uh, causal factor. But we're seeing it far, far earlier because this system is showing you the causal factors of the accelerated failure in the insulation rather than the results of that degradation of the insulation. So put together, you have a much more holistic, permanent uh, monitoring capability that's centralized, that's automating your inspections and optimizing scheduled maintenance. So uh, ironically, I chose uh, this as an example uh, to give everyone of, of cable condition monitoring. This is a 400 kV circuit uh, here in Spain. I'm in Bilbao today for the um, offshore wind conference, the European offshore wind conference. And you know, ironically enough, one of these systems is deployed uh, right here in Spain, where we're monitoring every single cross bonding point, every joint saying, what are the harmonic, uh, what's the harmonic content and what are the changes in harmonics over time? What is that compared to the load current at each of these critical joints and bays and cross bonding points? What's that related to the temperature of these uh, uh, these critical uh, weak points? And when you put all of that together in one system, you have a simple way to say, hey, 20 of these joints look the same, but one of them is now deviating and looking different. Well, great. Let's go and look at the one that's different because that 
is an aberration. That's a, an outlier or the rate of change could actually be the cue, not even the fact that it's different, but how fast it deviates from all of the others that should be the same in the same system. So it's about automation of the condition monitoring in a remote asset. I hope that gives you a, a, a sense of it. And I also included this picture because I wanted to give you a sense of how that's deployed here as a retrofit on some export cables from an offshore wind farm. And what you're seeing here is a combination of the classic iron core CTs that you can see in the middle here surrounding the phase cables, which are 66 kV rated, and looking for transients, pecking faults, harmonic content, something that looks wrong in the signal, comparing that also with temperatures to understand if we're opt if we're running the asset at an optimal level. So at one level, we're saying, let's use this to identify as early as possible an impending fault. So we've got time to do something about it before it explodes. But also at another level, it's giving you a very accurate and very useful real-time thermal rating so that you can optimize safely the potential capacity of the circuit. And beyond that, of course, as you build this data over time, you start to use that data to optimize scheduled maintenance. Uh, as with the previous example, the, you know, the, the philosophy here is uh, if we're looking at a, a mega project like Dogger Bank, uh, which is the world's off biggest offshore wind farm that we are instrumenting, I think it's 112 cables. We're saying if 111 look the same and one of them looks different, visit the one that looks different because there's a good reason something's going wrong. And it's better to do it when we see a problem than to visit because it's Friday afternoon. And that's how you save operating cost, time and money. Uh, in fact, there's an example uh, showing all the, it was 112 uh, cables reaching out there into the North Sea uh, with a huge system deploying hundreds and hundreds of sensors in many locations. But this is the point about the scalability. Uh, we, we could have 20 or 30 of these interrogators in the rack monitoring thousands of measurands at the same time. And that's really the message that we wanted to give everyone today when we talk about this technology. If you were to summarize DES and why it's unique, it's about cutting down by something close to half the capital cost of instrumentation in difficult places that are remote or where you don't have power or you don't have telecoms. It's about reducing operating cost because you're automating the monitoring permanently and synchronously and looking for deviations or the odd one out analytics, as some people call it. And fundamentally, it's reducing risk. If you can see these problems coming, you can reduce risk. And that can be incredibly significant as part of the justification for the business case of installing cables or building a new offshore wind farm. Uh, in, in their case, if you lose a cable, the minimum cost is in the range of seven or eight million euros and three months of outage. So clearly, even avoiding one or two of those events over 30 years would be an enormous payback relative to the cost of the system up front. Uh, in fact, it's a, a de minimis cost, maybe 1% of the cable package. Um, but at the same time, that expenditure will give you this granular visibility and control, much better resiliency and flexibility, totally secure. There are, again, no data outside the substation. So we're not relying on IP packet data. We're not relying on data networks. We're not relying on 4G or any kind of uh, remote power scavenging or capacitors and batteries that might need to be replaced later on in life. Um, it's clearly uh, a safety enhancement if you can warn people about the line coming down and high impedance faults can be seen, or if you're avoiding sending people out in crew transfer vessels in the North Sea at winter to inspect remote places or access something dangerous or doing line inspections, we can do that remotely um, from the center. And it's about improving that real-time visibility and control so that the network becomes more flexible and adaptable to this growth of demand and the growth in distributed generation. So think of it as a wide area instrumentation technology that gives you enhanced control, but without the data networks, the control power or the civil works, it's probably the civil works that saves the most money uh, for our customers. And once you have deployed it, you've got this synchronous and very scalable monitoring permanently uh, through the lifetime of the asset to watch what's happening and how things evolve over time. And from that, of course, you can learn a lot about the future value, replacement and repair strategies can be informed by having this real 
concrete data that's very detailed about all the waveforms and all the temperatures and all the correlations that are happening out there. Now, mostly uh, that that's a very long term thought, and what's what it's mostly used for is simply an improved protection response or earlier warning of these cable failure modes compared to conventional or traditional monitoring technologies uh, in order to optimize the maintenance and the operational cost of the asset. So. While I appreciate that's an awful lot to throw at everyone in one session, we wanted to give you that overall summary picture and ideally take no more than 40 minutes presenting data to you, which I think I've achieved, yep, for 40 minutes, where we've tried to give you a taste of what is possible. Now, very often what happens is we'll present this to a customer who says, that's great, but I need you to monitor ice on my lines, or I want to work with... Uh, a new kind of conductor technology, maybe these sort of low sag, high temperature uh, uh, conductors, or we've got other problems like we've got new grid connections from data centers. The message today is it doesn't matter what the problem is. If you've got an inaccessible or remote asset, we can help instrument it and speed up those grid connections or make safer and less risky some new venture, or we can see those lines and uh, SAG and vertical uh, ground clearance changes from far away in safety instead of sending people out in helicopters and drones or bad weather or dangerous environments to reach the asset. And we hope you'll find that that's very useful for your business and can either help you as a supply chain partner to differentiate your offerings and reduce the cost and time it takes to deploy projects, or if you're an asset owner or operator, it certainly will help uh, to give you more discrete control over a wider area for an affordable cost uh, and uh, therefore realize some operational cost savings. So with that in mind, uh, I'll stop the lecture now and thank everyone uh, for your attention so far. I know that there have been some questions and answers happening in the background here uh, because there are quite a lot of questions that have come up that maybe we can help answer and explain to people. So um, I know uh, just to recap for everyone, because it's not in the chat and so not everyone can see all the, the Q&A here. Uh, let me just see if there's some uh, answers and questions that we can share with the group. So please provide technical explanation regarding the application of DES as a fault locator function. Oh, OK. So um, clearly what we are saying at first with this technology is that you can take a very long line and break it up into multiple zones and therefore you can have more discrete faulted section identification. Now within that, uh, because it's an optical technology, there are various different ways that we can then do fault location after the event. Um, that could be achieved by doing uh, impedance to fault by comparing, you know, uh, voltage and current and seeing where the uh, where it drops on the line and calculating uh, to about one percent of the line length where you where the fault is likely to be. If you have a fault where the fiber is co-located with the conductor, so that example would be like in a trefoil cable, uh, you've actually got the fiber along with the three phase conductors. In that scenario, the fault, to, the face to face fault is likely to damage or burn out the fiber as well. And if you're using 61850, um, you actually have an advantage because you will get suddenly an invalid signal from a series of the sensors beyond the fault because the fiber is broken and you've lost sight of the sensors through that fiber. So you could use the fiber itself as a fault location mechanism. And ultimately, it's even possible to think about this technology being deployed as like a optical time domain reflectometry system or OTDR so that you could also just measure the light forwards and backwards and understand where that break is along the fiber, which indicates where the fault is. So underground or subsea, that could be very powerful. Otherwise, the fault location uh, online isn't necessarily something we do normally, but it's possible to use an impedance to fault calculation algorithm to get to it. So I think that could be um, hopefully a, a useful answer uh, to those questions. Um, but again, fundamentally, it's about multi-zone protection and faulted section identification primarily. Um, that said, I, um, I should also acknowledge, as many of you have seen, that we have uh, now uh, formed not only an investment partnership, but also a commercial partnership uh, with our new investors who are mega 
uh, the manufacturers of uh, test equipment. And of course, they also are able to bring and add to our system, you know, pre energized testing equipment in the pre energization and commissioning stage, like for Tan Delta and PD testing, uh, their kits available. So we can also call on that stuff to locate faults and check uh, where the problem is after we've cleared the fault and the, and the line is out. Um, Oh, sorry, there's another question here as well that's worth repeating to everyone. What happens if the distance is more than 60 kilometers, which is a fair question. Uh, actually, so two of the big transmission projects we're doing at the moment are much further than 60 kilometers, but it's not 60 kilometers substation to substation. There's always an interim substation somewhere, or we can access with an interrogator from one end. Uh, let's say that's Substation number one reaching in 60 kilometers. And then in substation two, we can put another uh, interrogator and look the other way. And that would give you 120 kilometers straight away. Uh, it depends on the topology of the circuit. It also depends on the uh, tolerance for accuracy uh, and distances that are involved. But we haven't yet found a circuit that we couldn't instrument uh, across transmission. But the 60 kilometer limit is something that actually our engineers uh, and our team self-imposed. It says within 60 kilometers in normal conditions with normal, you know, mid, a middle uh, quality fiber and middle aged fiber, because the age of the fiber can make a difference. Um, we think we can see all, up to 30 sensors in that radius because we need to see 30 individual reflections back through the fiber. Eventually there'll be too much noise and signal loss you know and attenuation problems in that fiber and so eventually uh, you might have a problem but you could reach a long way and take one measurement and then maybe a second measurement another 60 kilometers away if you increase the density of the sensors up to 30 that could prove difficult it depends on the uh, multiple factors about the uh, dynamic range, accuracy, and condition of the fiber, how much dB loss there is along the fiber. Uh, that's about how many connectors and splices there are. So we always check using OTDR where possible what the actual fiber condition is on a circuit before we deploy, because that's part of calibration and FAT prior to the delivery of the system. So apologies if that was a long-winded answer, but the, the short answer is we can go further in some conditions and for condition monitoring, uh, we simply take one fiber as far as it goes, then we can take another fiber, another fiber, another fiber. And each time you take a fiber core, it can reach somewhere else and measure something else. So the limitation is 20 or 30 sensors per fiber channel, but there's no limit on the number of fiber channels. I hope that makes better sense. I hope I answered that in a way that that's understandable. Um, and I think that touches on uh, another um, another question that came in here about underground cable monitoring. So, you know, what happens if we need to do more than 30 sensors? Well, I, 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 hopefully to some degree I answered that because what we're saying is uh, if you take the example of Dogger Bank, as I said, it's the world's biggest offshore wind farm. I think we've got uh, almost a thousand monitoring locations and about 20 interrogators. So 20 different fibers reaching different places at different distances, but it's all centrally coordinated. So you have one window, one picture of all of those assets uh, and it's all synchronous because we can maintain sync uh, through the fiber per interrogator and between the interrogators to give you that, that visibility. So it's not that 60 kilometers or 30 sensors is an absolute limit. It's the limit per fiber channel, but you could have multiple fiber channels and multiple different uh, assets that you're looking at at the same time. So I hope that helps explain uh, how it scales up, uh, because otherwise it would be um, uh, uh, a very limiting system. OK, and then um, there's also a question here that came in later on, um, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll make that the last one for today and give everyone five minutes for a break at the end of this. The last question was about the highest voltage level that it can be applied upon. And that's an important point as I kind of brushed over that. Technically, we can see any voltage or any current magnitude. Um, the, the sensors, remember, are using standard VTs and CTs, and we're running off of the copper secondary, taking maybe like a 10 to 30 volt input signal, uh, therefore, you know, maybe 
five ten amps coming into our sensor, uh, the in the primary uh, energy level doesn't matter uh, because we're going to you just specify the right kind of CT with the right kind of if it's a bushing CT, you know, with enough standoff insulator to protect you. If it's AIS, if it's cables, doesn't matter. There's no insulation uh, for the CT. Uh, it's any. And the highest one that we've done, to my knowledge, is 400 kV, as an example. That's the one I showed you from Red Electrica in Madrid, in Spain here. Uh, so that's monitoring all those joints and link boxes and cross-bonding locations in a dual circuit, 400 kV circuit, which I believe is feeding about half of Madrid's power supply. Um, and there's about a 12-kilometer cable section that we're instrumenting for them there. Um, but But there is no theoretical limit uh, they, we, we could also operate and we are working now and deploying systems in India where they go up to 800 kV that would not be a problem okay um, I believe I've managed to cover for everyone and thanks to my team for answering questions in the background here I think that covers most of the questions but of course the idea of today is to prompt your thinking and to make you think about other ways we can deploy this and other uh, use cases that would provide either operational improvement benefits or reducing the you know the cost of instrumentation kind of benefits. So please use this session as a thought piece to stimulate your thinking about what could be done. And we'll obviously be able to engage with you on much more specific details of your particular circuits and Vena's particular geographical issues or limitations and constraints that you've got and work around them with you. That's how we like to work with all of our customers and, and make it fit their near operational requirements and priorities. Um, okay, so I really hope this helps and uh, it remains to say two things uh, today. Number one, thank you so many of you for registering and joining our webinar. I hope you found it useful. And number two, uh, please note that for all of you who have registered and attended, uh, we'll make a recording of this available to you and email you a link to that so that you can have an exclusive access to that uh, a, later this week. Uh, and then we'll leave it for a while before we post it up on our YouTube site. But just in case there are ever any questions, uh, please come back to us at sales at Synaptic or info at Synaptic at any time. And we'd be delighted to help you with whatever ch challenges you've got with operating and condition monitoring your power systems. So thank you very much. Appreciate you coming and please enjoy the rest of your day. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you.